On behalf of Catholic Regional Medical Center, Catholic Clinic, Catholic Health System, I want to welcome you today to our fourth annual Heart to Heart with Catholic. And we have a lot of different elements of the Catholic system that have come together to put on this event for us today. And I want to begin by thanking Nikki and Nan and Emily and Stephanie and everybody that had a hand in making this event happen because a lot of work has gone into today uh, as far as organizing this event and getting five physicians in one room for one hour. <laughs> that is borderline miracle. And so I want to thank all of my colleagues from Catholic for making this day possible. So let's start with that. Uh, um, I want to thank Nick from Charter and Lloyd Swain from Charter Cable. Uh, we use them a lot to videotape different educational forums that we do at Catholic, and then they rebroadcast them on their channel three. And so this will be on. Physicians, uh, you'll be able to see yourselves many, many times in the coming weeks. But we think it's a, a neat service that Charter provides because it allows folks the opportunity, if they can't come out on a day like today, to be able to see and learn uh, what was talked about at these various events. So uh, we're appreciative of that. As we mentioned, uh, we have a wonderful panel established for you today. And I just want to introduce each of them so you can tell who they are. Some of you probably know them intimately. Uh, but uh, our first physician is who, uh, someone who you might see if you are experiencing heart attack and you are brought into the emergency department. Dr. Holly Cooper is a board certified emergency room physician at Cadillac Regional Medical Center. Her expertise and the fact that she's a woman give her the unique insight to help all of us understand the incidence of heart disease in women. Please welcome Dr. Holly Cooper. Now, since the year 2001, Cadillac has been home to the region's open heart surgery and interventional cardiology services. This means folks that are suffering from heart attacks or in need of major cardiac interventions come to Cadillac. And it's interesting to know from not only throughout the Tri-Cities, but the surrounding region as well. I remember when we started this service back in 2001, after the first year, we looked at the data of where the patients were coming from for either the catheterization or the, the blockage where the, having that cleared or open heart surgery. And we were found that one in six patients that were coming to Cadillac after that first year were from the state of Oregon. So I think that really told us that all of a sudden, um, we became a regional medical center as opposed to a Tri-Cities based hospital. So the reach of Cadillac geographically um, reached a lot farther after uh, having this vital services here. And a key member of the first responders is Cadillac's cardiac team, and that would be people like interventional, interventional cardiologist Dr. Fadi Alkaisi. He is with Cadillac Clinic Inland Cardiology. Thank you for being here today, Dr. Alkaisi. He is board certified in internal medicine, interventional cardiology, cardiovascular disease, nuclear cardiology, cardiovascular computed tomography, or CT. You've been going to school for about 30 years? <laughs> Please welcome Dr. Alkaisi. Um, Dr. James Canneller. He is a, a newcomer to the Tri-Cities, but uh, some of you may be acquainted with him. He is from Spokane and has recently joined Inland Cardiology. He is a fellow of the American Heart Rhythm Society. That's not a dance group. Uh, he's a member of the American College of Cardiology, the American Heart Association, the American College of Physicians, American Medical Association, and the Canadian Cardiovascular Society. Now, in his practice, he treats patients with heart rhythm disturbances called arrhythmias, including palpitations, heart racing, irregular heartbeat, and other symptoms such as blackouts and unexplained falls. I need to see this guy. As a local, full-time, what's called EP cardiologist, he will treat the heart's electrical impulses to reduce symptoms and improve his patient's comfort and quality of life. Dr. Canella, welcome to the Tri-Cities and thanks for being here. <laughs> At the far end of our table, uh, Dr. Hanan Shogli and Dr. Juan Cordero. Dr. Shogli is one of two heart surgeons at Cadillac Clinic. He came to the Tri-Cities, joining Cadillac in 2008, has over 20 years experience in cardiothoracic and vascular surgery. He specializes in coronary artery bypass, valves, carotid surgery, performs over 15 surgeries per month. Dr. Chowgli is a fellowship trained in cardiothoracic surgery and endovascular surgery, and he's board certified in surgery and thoracic surgery. Dr. Chowgli, welcome uh, to our panel this afternoon. <laughs> Dr. Juan Cordero, 
He has been at the Tri-Cities and Cadillac Clinic's cardiothoracic program since, uh, since 2006, and he specializes in adult cardiac surgery, has performed over 1,000 surgeries at Cadillac. Dr. Cordero holds a fellowship in cardiovascular research and thoracic surgery, and he is board certified in surgery and thoracic surgery, and he's a pretty good golfer, too. Please welcome Dr. Juan Cordero. Now, before we get to our panelists, uh, we wanted to hear you from someone who uh, was directly impacted by uh, heart, a heart disease and a heart attack. And that is my friend Susan Center. Some of you might know Sue. Uh, she's a, were you born and raised, born in the Tri-Cities? Yeah. But I know she's lived in the Tri-Cities for many years, works out at Pacific Northwest National Lab. And Sue suffered a heart attack at age 47, is that correct? And you wouldn't tell by looking at Sue that she suffered a heart attack. But heart disease is a family history issue for her. And what, what I enjoy about Sue is she is so willing to share her story with you. Some of you may have heard her speak before at different events. She has a very powerful story. And we want to kick off our discussion on women's heart disease by having you hear from Susan Center. Sue? OK. Um, if you're like me, you're busy as a woman. The more I have on my plate, the more I accomplish. I wouldn't characterize myself as an overachiever. I'm just able to juggle a lot and get it all done. I'm the oldest of five children. I was reared in an Irish Catholic family. I like to refer to myself as the matriarch of my family. My siblings, many of you who know them, would probably characterize, characterize me differently. <laughs> what happened to me and how I've changed my lifestyle to ensure survival is really all that qualifies me to stand in front of you today. It was 7 o'clock on a Saturday morning in September. I looked at the clock on the wall and I started ticking off in my mind all that I had to accomplish before noon that day. My two sons had a barbecue for their hockey team. I had to get their clothes ready. I had to figure out what I was going to make, run to the store, make my potluck dish, and get there by noon, no problem. The catch was that I was laying on a gurney in Cadillac's catheterization lab. So 90 minutes prior, I'd suffered a heart attack. What's amazing is that I actually figured I could scramble around and get out of there and be at that barbecue by noon. <laughs> so with my shiny new stint in place, I thought I could pick up where I left off. It took me several weeks for it to sink in how severe the situation was and that I couldn't keep doing the same things and expecting different results. Turning back the clock to 5.30 that morning, I woke to a really strange sensation throughout my entire body. Everything constricted from my head to my toes. It felt like it, everything just sucked in. So I wasn't real steady on my feet. I got out of bed, made my way to the kitchen, and I took three bare aspirin. Then I woke my husband. He had been in Spokane the day before playing 36 holes of golf. I had made my son's homemade pizza, so he said, whatever's bothering you is likely the pizza you, you made last night. And I said, no, don't think that's it. And he said, well, you're probably overreacting. So, um, growing up in a home with an emergency room nurse as a mother, we didn't go to the hospital unless things were really, really dire. My mother would share stories about people who would come in for that things weren't of, um, of need to be in an emergency room, and we didn't want to be one of those people. But that morning, I wasted little time figuring out that a trip to the ER warranted, was warranted for me. I just knew something was wrong. So away we went. We left our boys, aged 12 and 13 at the time, home asleep in bed. It took a few minutes for my husband to get moving, but once he, he saw me in the car, he realized you know, something was really wrong. Um, I was rocking back and forth with my hands on my chest, um, opening, closing the window, trying to, to catch my breath. So you know, afterward, I realized that was one of the symptoms, shortness of breath. We got to the ER and met a triage nurse who took all my information. And I was really impressed that we didn't have to wait before we got in there. And she said, oh, honey, people with chest pains don't wait. <laughs> so once inside, uh, we met with a hospitalist who evaluated my symptoms, took my family history, and decided it was best to engage an on-call cardiologist. In the meantime, the IV meds they gave me helped to stabilize me, and they started take, doing tests to check the condition of my heart. The result, result of those tests in 
uh, collaboration with my family history won me a trip to the heart cath lab. So I had 90% blockage in my left anterior descending artery. And before I left here, I was watching the view, and that's what Rosie O'Donnell had, but she had 100% blockage. So I had 90% blockage, and that's the main pathway of blood to supply your heart. I remember the cardiologist saying to me, well, you're not overweight, you don't smoke, you must be swimming in a bad gene pool. So a stent in place, a night in the hospital, a canceled business trip the next day to Texas, and no hockey barbecue, I went home from the hospital the next day to pick off where I left off, so I thought. So I stayed home from, from work for a week, went back to work the following Monday, and then saw my cardiologist that afternoon. And he had not seen me since I experienced this heart attack. He informed me that it was not gonna be life as usual, and that I had sustained heart damage, so something had to change. My first stop was the Catholics cardiac rehabilitation program, and some of the folks from that program are here today, and they were there when I was there. Uh, it's a phenomenal program. It got me going on a, a rigorous exercise program and gave me the information and support I needed to make some changes in my life. It was through, through connections with cardiac rehab and people like Jim Hall and Nikki Ostergaard, Nan Domenici, that I started becoming more and more involved in heart healthy activities. I participated in numerous Go Red for Women events throughout the region in recent years. One of the most powerful messages I heard from a woman a few years ago who had also suffered a heart attack. She said that after feeling for a long time that her body had let her down, she came to realize that it was she who let her body down. So that stuck with me and I hope it will stick with you. Be aware of your personal risk factors. Know your family history. Uh, Jim mentioned that my family has uh, heart disease in it. My father died of a heart attack. My mother had open heart surgery and also has a pacemaker that was put in last June. And my two younger brothers, 10 years younger, both have stents in their hearts. Know the symptoms for women and pay attention to what your body is telling you. In the mail this week, you got Catholic's Heart Healthy publication. Read that, it's armed with some really good information. I knew something was off for me that September morning. And I've been told repeatedly since then that because I took aspirin and because I got to the hospital within 30 minutes if I woke up to those symptoms, the damage to my heart was minimal. I've been asked a lot in recent years, why did you take three aspirin that morning instead of just one? I figured, well, I didn't know it was wrong, but I figured three was better than one. <laughs> know what actions to take. Okay, make sure you take those aspirin. Don't delay in getting medical attention. Once my husband finally realized that something was seriously wrong with me, we wasted no time in getting to the hospital. What I've learned since then is, don't have someone take you, call 911. Folks like these gentlemen on the right, the ambulances are equipped to start running tests and getting you stable so that when you get to the emergency room and you meet with Dr. Cooper, she already has that information and could really get moving on the course of treatment for you. So always call 911 if you feel like things are seriously impacting your heart. In the last decade, the United States has seen a 30% reduction in deaths from cardiovascular disease. That's huge, excuse me. Particularly considering that we have an aging population. Technology continues to advance and we have well-trained doctors like these individuals to my left who have access to scientific data that's improving and being available just by leaps and bounds. Things like national registries that help them to determine how best to uh, outline a course of treatment for you. I'll be 56 this year and just about to celebrate my 30th wedding anniversary. I'm eating better, exercising regularly, and now have perspective to know what's important in my life. Don't wait to experience what I did to realize how quickly it can all be taken away. Your heart is depending on you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sue. Can you hear me? Hello, hello, hello. Thank you, Sue. And does that ring home to any of you out there in the audience? Uh, very powerful words. And I just appreciate you being so willing to share your story with us. Now, we're going to get into uh, the discussion part of our program where 
some of the points that Sue just raised, you might have some questions similar to on that subject matter. So we invite you, if you have a question for any of our panelists, we have cardiology, we have electrophysiology, we have cardiac and thoracic surgery, and we have emergency room medicine. So we have a lot of expertise up here. Uh, don't be bashful, just we ask that you raise your hand, and I have Nan and Nikki will have a microphone on either end of the room. Raise your hand, and they will find you with the microphone, and we will work our way through our discussion today, this afternoon, uh, for, with our physicians today. I will start a question while we uh, make our way here, and Sue mentioned the point of aspirin a day. What is all of your recommendation on that? Or you hear that, that thing to take a, is it a baby aspirin? Is that that what's most typically done? I think everybody looking at me. So <laughs> <laughs> Dr. al <laughs> So uh, let's start before we answer the question about aspirin to differentiate the use of aspirin for uh, two populations. We have the what we call the secondary prevention for aspirin, which means that people that have proven they have problem with their heart or stroke or they had a heart attack or they have proven blockages in the arteries of the heart or the arteries of the legs. Those people, we call them secondary prevention. Aspirin is definitely uh, has been proven to be beneficial to them to minimize the incidence of additional events in the future. The question 81 or 325 milligrams. There have been a lot of studies about that. And so, so far, the majority of data favors the lower dose of aspirin, 81 to 162 milligram a day, to have the benefit of it without getting into the side effects of bleeding. Although the bleeding side effect might be low, but we don't want to have a bleeding in the brain or a stroke or a GI bleeding. That will lead us to the next point, which is primary prevention. People who have never had problem before with the heart, they have never had a stroke before, should they take aspirin or not? And then we run into the side and uh, the benefit and risk ratio. And then we evaluate the risk individually. If they are running on the high risk of uh, heart disease, family history, or they have high cholesterol, they have diabetes, then these people, we recommend for them to have primary prevention with aspirin. Whereas people, they don't have risk factors. They are not diabetic. They just might have mild hypertension. Otherwise, they are healthy. They run. They are exercising. We usually don't recommend for them to have aspirin. If we are going to use aspirin for primary prevention, usually we recommend the low dose of aspirin, 81 milligram, to minimize the risk of bleeding. Um, I've heard about exercise and diet. Is there a role for meditation in uh, prevention of heart disease? <laughs> there, uh, meditation is all, let's take this back one step back. Stress is a known risk factor for heart disease. It's difficult to quantify it to say stress plays this portion of heart disease for the lack of studies, not to mention it's something different, difficult to measure. Having said that, obviously, any uh, methods to minimize stress, such as meditation, yoga, and exercise. Some people, they like weightlifting. It gets uh, the energy out of them. So, yeah, yes, it will help. Now, has been there any proof for that? Not to my knowledge. I'm not sure if any of other physicians are aware of that studies. But it has not been ev evaluated. But obviously, observational studies have been shown that stress relief uh, methods will improve overall health, including the uh, health. So again, although we don't have strong data behind that, but uh, definitely that something will improve the overall health. Uh, from your view with patients that come into the emergency room, especially females, you probably hear a lot of that. I'm a busy, I have a busy, busy life, and help me understand how I can make that less stressful to my body. 
I think, first of all, just to address the woman that spoke about meditation, like Dr. Alcazi said, there's not a lot of firm studies, but it is observationally observed, especially with individuals that have had catastrophic illness, whether it be a terminal type cancer, um, a major trauma, uh, something to your heart, that people who have some type of stress reduction, either some type of spiritual base or meditation, that their quality of life is better and their length of survival is better. How that exactly plays in to all the reasons and whys, we don't have the answers for. But there definitely is, seems to be a correlation consistently. In terms, what was the second part of your question? Mm -hmm. So I make sure I answer Just this. The stress piece. The stress piece. This is, this is my delightful thing, because I was listening to her clicking off of her little list at 7 AM and thinking that she's going to be out um, at the barbecue. And I see this a lot. I see the person who drives themselves in and says, oh, I'm just stressed. I just want, just hook me up to those leads and make sure it's OK and let me go. And I'm the one that has to say, that's not enough. And then like, well, you know, I've just been really under a lot of pressure. So I just, I probably just need to get more rest. And my answer is, stress today at this moment is not going to kill you. But if I miss something happening in your heart, it may. And I can't always sort that out in five minutes with one piece of paper. When I do sort it out with one piece of paper, you're in real trouble. Because I'm calling Dr. Alcazi and saying, this person needs to go to the cath lab right now. The majority of people, I'm saying, guess what? You have just bought yourself to a 24-hour stay in our lovely hospital with its excellent food and service. Because it takes more than one piece of paper to truly make sure that you're not actively having even a small heart attack. And if you don't even have that, you may still have heart disease. And the whole goal of why you're here today, yes, aspirin is important and all those treatments are important, but really by the time you've come to see me and it's maybe your heart, we're behind and you're behind and you're already in trouble. So ideally, if we could get people across the states and women across the states to recognize the risks of heart disease and to apply the reduction of those risks to their lives, including stress, including exercise and diet, not smoking, and being lean and being fit, then the rest of us would be out of a job, or at least greatly decreased, and we would be golfing or skiing more. Or working at McDonald's. <laughs> yeah. In which case, our stress levels would be going up. <laughs> and um, I encourage people not to be punitive and think of all the stress they experience as negative and somehow we have to get rid of it and we end up in this self-punishing mode um, where we're always um, counteracting our own impulses to achieve and succeed. Some studies from the stress literature have shown that patient perception of stress is extremely important. If you, ex if you um, perceive the stress in your life as essential and necessary and a positive thing to propel you forward, having that perception is much healthier than having a negative perception of your stress. In fact, the negative perception of stress can correlate with earlier mortality related to stress. Having said that, we also recognize that a lot of stress or too much stress or severe stress is indeed a risk factor for cardiovascular disease and this can cause immortality and, or sorry, early mortality and decreased quality of life. So for the meditation piece, I think really important to have that kind of activity in your, in your routine. If it's, if it's meditation, wonderful. If it's another outlet that substitutes um, just as well for you. But to have that piece to re-equilibrate, eliminate the extreme stresses we can all get exposed to, and then also realize that we're going to need some amount of stress in our lives just to function and to try to view that stress as positively as possible and helping us achieve is a nice take on, on stress. And that's kind of the position that I'm holding for myself right now and that I've been passing on to a number of my patients who asked me about um, that topic. We have a question over here. So what can we do, or are there tests we can ask our doctors to give us through our annual routine, you know, going to the doctor, that can give us more information on if it's something we need to be concerned about versus waiting until we have chest pains or other symptoms that we're rushed to the doctor? Absolutely. That's an excellent uh, question. And that will lead us to the part of as Dr. Cooper said, that you need to be ahead of the game. 
you need to screen for problems. You need to look for heart disease and prevent that from happening. For example, in the world of the breast cancer, it has been like mammograms and examinations to help reduction of colon cancer, and we have the colonoscopies. We come to the heart world, coronary artery disease. Do we need to have a screening test? And then we start with the basic information, history, traditional risk factors. Look for high blood pressure, look for diabetes, look for the high cholesterol, look for the family history, smoking, weight, exercise. Those are the traditional risk factors that we always look for. And these are the things that we, if we identify early stages, we need to address them. High blood pressure to treat, diabetes to control, cholesterol, same thing, quit smoking and exercise. Then we come to the next point. Should we have any tests, as you said, to evaluate for um, underlying heart disease? And there have been a lot of tests to test for, for to evaluate for that. Many of the, let me just talk about the stress test as part of these screening forms. Then I will talk about the other tests and I'm not gonna take a lot of time. The screening tests has been a lot of controversy about it, but the majority of data favors not to using as a screening tool. Because the stress test is looking for a one-time evaluation for the arteries and the heart condition. It does not look for the overall risk for the heart. In other words, heart attacks, they come from plaques or fat building on the walls of the arteries. It may not be big enough to block the artery to cause abnormalities on the stress test. But that plaque building on the wall of the artery in one morning, it may decide to come angry, rupture, cause a major clot and blockage in the arteries. The stress test does not predict that. So the short answer for that is not to recommend for the stress test as a screening tool. The other test that may help us, such as blood test, there is something we call high sensitivity CRP. It's a test that reflects the inflammatory burden in the body. And the studies have shown that on top of the traditional risk factors, if the patient ends up in the gray area or in the intermediate zone of risk stratification, such blood tests will help the physician to re-stratify these patients either to low or high, and so change the management. Another tool might be the calcium burning in CAT scan. And again, that's another tool. I don't want to spend a lot of time explaining each one of the tools. The other tools such as the carotid thickness and other tools, they have not been, they did not do very well in the studies and they are not very well documented to apply them for everybody. So the summary is screening goes down to the traditional risk factors. This is the most important tool to screen for heart disease. I want to introduce our two heart surgeons uh, to the discussion now in that when, when it gets to, to the case where someone needs open heart surgery, Dr. Cordero or Dr. Chowgli, what how, what's the determining factor of between when, whether they, uh, a stent or an angioplasty can be the, be the remedy or if they need open heart surgery? And really how, I guess on top of that, is how, how, how much time does somebody need to allocate, because soon had to get back to that barbecue, <laughs> but how much do they need to really realistically understand that their lives are going to be changed before they can start feeling back to maybe where they were before? Yeah. Want to take it? Sure. Well, I can start and you can. Yeah. Um, the keys are that, you know, all the patients that we see are treated as a, as a team. So uh, the way we approach uh, uh, the disease is that we discuss the cases. So every patient is, is a different uh, uh, paradigm. And uh, so when we, when we see patients uh, in the cath lab, uh, we discuss them with Dr. Arkazi, with the cardiologist. 
Uh, most of the time the patients have single one vessel, that's the problem. Uh, and it's a lesion that can be treated uh, easily from in terms of how calcified it is, is there branching. Then a lot of times those lesions get treated by the cardiologists who are not involved. Uh, patients who have a lot of disease, very diffuse disease, those are the type of patients that end up uh, being treated surgically, especially diabetics. But w one of the key points to make is that all, most of the treatments in cardiovascular medicine are palliative. That means we're not curing the disease. So whether you, whether you have a stent placed for a blockage, whether you have open heart surgery, we're not curing the disease. So one of the most important things to take away is really risk factor modification. We operate on patients and we can bypass five, six, seven vessels. If the patient leaves the hospital and they return to their former lifestyle and they have multiple risk factors and those risk factors are not changed, then the patient will return with recurrent disease because the disease continues. We're rewriting blood flow, we're providing better blood flow to the muscle, we're decreasing symptoms, and we're decreasing the risk of a reintervention. but we do not alter the course of the risk factors and it's not a curative operation. And stents are not a curative treatment either. So really the most important thing to take away is that risk factor modification is really what you need to do. Yeah. Anyway, just to emphasize that we, that the, we do not, we, this is a palliative operation. I tell all my patients that at home, if your sink is clogged, you call a plumber and plumber sees, okay, there's a blockage there takes a pipe, goes before the blockage and after the blockage. So what you want is a sink to drain. We look at ourselves as cardiac plumbers. Patient, <laughs> come, patient comes with a heart disease. There's a blockage out there. What we do is get read out the blood, either by using a mammary artery or the vein from the leg, so that your heart should get blood. That's important. We leave the blockage as it is. We don't do anything to the blockage. Your heart is getting more blood now and you are fine. But Going back to the analogy of the sink, if you keep putting junk in the sink, the new bypass will get blocked sooner. Same thing with heart surgery. If you do a bypass, we may do six, seven, eight bypasses. But if you do not change your lifestyle, you do not change your diet, you do not care about your weight, you do not stop smoking, you are going to be back very soon. So it's very, very important that after heart surgery or after stent, people should get a wake-up call and say, okay, Whatever I'm doing is wrong. You may be fit and healthy, but then you think, okay, if I was fit and healthy, why did I get blockage? Maybe it's bad genes, so I need to modify something. Maybe my cholesterol, which is within normal range, but that is high for you. That's the reason you got blockages. So you have to be on cholesterol lowering medication. I get patients all the time with heart disease coming and telling me, oh, my cholesterol is normal, but uh, the doctor wants me to take cholesterol lowering medication. And then it's normal for the population, but it's not normal for you. So you better take cholesterol lowering medication. And as far as the second question about the duration, obviously, if you have heart surgery, you won't be going home to the barbecue the same day or the next day <laughs> or the next week. <laughs> typically, typically, oh, like 20 years ago, when I started doing cardiac surgery, patients should be in the hospital for 10 days and 15 days and then we tell them don't do anything for four, three, four months. And usually by the end of three months, they're back to normal. Like the reason we do heart surgery, bypass surgery, is to improve the quality of life. I don't think anyone sitting up here can say we improve the quantity of life, we improve the quality of life. So when we do bypass surgery, I tell all my patients, you should be, have a better quality of life than what you had before you came to me. So typically, we a uh, patient is in the hospital for, in the ICU for one day after the operation, and three to four days in the cardiac unit, and they're discharged home. The only restriction we have on the patient is not to lift weight more than five to 10 pounds for six weeks. And not, that's not for the heart, that's for the bone, because we give you a controlled fracture of your sternum. And as everyone knows that the bone takes about six weeks to heal completely, and after that, you should be back to normal. You should feel much, much better. And I have patients coming back to me and telling me, doctor, I feel like five years or 10 years younger after his operation. And that is very natural because what happens is subconsciously, you have heart disease, your body slows down without you realizing it. 
And once you have the bypass surgery or the stent, then your body, heart suddenly gets a lot of blood and say, oh, we can do much more. We have a question right down here in front. I had a question for Dr. Kanella. Um, regarding arrhythmias, what's the difference between a flutter and a fibrillation? Is that the right? That's absolutely the right term. Is that um, well, I would say both of those are fast rhythms in the top chamber of your heart. Um, for me, the difference is the mechanism that that fast rhythm is sustaining itself. I would think of a fibrillation as a very complex and chaotic process involving um, both chambers, um, like a hurricane taking place in the heart. I would think of a flutter as a as a fixed circuit of electrical activity spinning around an anatomical structure, usually one of your valves. So the flutters are very regular, very relentless because they're on a fixed race course and the fuel is an endless supply. Um, the fibrillatory processes are more complex and chaotic in their dynamics. Um, the implications of both of those rhythms for a patient is similar in that having either a fibrillation or a flutter does cause the blood flow in the top chambers of your heart to stagnate, which can allow it to form clots, which your heart could then potentially pump to your brain and cause stroke. That's the main risk that we're working against in either one of those rhythms. And of course, if you're gonna stay in one of those rhythms or come out of one and you're at risk for going back in, um, we should have you on a blood thinner. And so that's something to discuss individually. Then the other issue is symptoms. Everyone's different, but people typically don't feel well in either fibrillation or flutter. And frequently people feel a little bit worse in flutter um, because they're more difficult to control. And then we talk about um, rate controlling strategies versus rhythm controlling strategies. Are we just trying to slow the heart down so that the symptoms from the rhythm are less, or are we actually trying to stop that rhythm and keep your heart in normal rhythm? And strategies for either person can, can vary, and we consider those individually. What do those options include from your, in your view, in, in, when, in your expertise, with what kinds of treatment how do you treat a fibrillation, so to speak? How do we treat a fibrillation? Um, so our immediate concern, if so, if you were to come into my office with a new diagnosis of atrial fibrillation, for example, I'd be interested in how fast is your heart rate, and we'd measure that on an EKG, and I'd be interested in whether you're having symptoms. Do you feel mm -hmm. rapid heart race? Do you feel fatigue? Um, symptoms of these nature from that rhythm as opposed to being in a normal rhythm. Our first priority is probably to try to slow you down with medications that can also facilitate you going into a normal rhythm and staying there. But our immediate con concern is um, rate control and then based on your risk factor profile should we be starting blood thinning medications to protect against stroke. Um, that's an exciting new field that has a number of options that have become available in the last couple of years that were not available previously. Um, so those are so, those are sort of the immediate considerations. Where can we go? Decisions down the road are, are we gonna try to keep you in normal rhythm and are we gonna use an antiarrhythmic drug, a very specific medication that um, not everyone's qualified to prescribe might be the right thing for you to keep you in normal rhythm. And ultimately the decision in the back of my mind is, will this person progress to a catheter ablation procedure for atrial fibrillation? With the goal of ameliorating symptoms by eliminating the fibrillation, or if there is still recurrence of atrial fibrillation post ablation, hopefully making that fibrillation less symptomatic as a result of the ablation and more easy to control with medical therapy. So if I meet you, I see that whole spectrum simultaneously. And then <laughs> just try to navigate which, which options are best for you. Question from our audience? Yes, sir. Yeah, I'm uh, 86 years old. In the year 2000, I had a four-way bypass up at Sacred Heart. And Dr. Fishwan at the time, they wanted to have my valve changed too, and uh, he thought it would be too much. So anyway, I'm still kicking, and, uh, <laughs> and I still have a calcium buildup in my valve. They say it's tight. Is there? Uh, what would you recommend with due to my age? Yeah. Uh, 
Nowadays, there is an exciting new treatment available for aortic valve. And like people uh, who are elderly who cannot undergo heart surgery or who are very high risk for heart surgery like yourself because you already have a bypass surgery in the past, you're 86 years old. There is some experimental study going on at the moment where we can go through your groin and put a new aortic valve in. There's a high complication rate for that at the moment, but uh, it is. And probably down the road, five or six years from now, it will be a very common procedure performed everywhere. At the moment, only a few specialized centers do that operation. Can I just the, the other thing that's kind of important to know is how tight your valve is and how active you are, because if, if, if you're not very <laughs> if, if you're not very active and so if you're not very active, and, and you, certainly your valve could be followed, but it could potentially be that, that you live your entire existence without having that valve uh, needing to be intervened on. Um, but certainly close follow-up would, would be warranted. The progression is variable from patient to patient, but some valves will continue to calcify and progress, and some of them we follow, and they don't, even though they meet criteria as being tight, they don't, they don't uh, continue to progress a, a, at the same rate as others. That's why I'm, I'm saying sometimes we see patients and the progression is very slow or not at all. I just have one quick comment. Go ahead. Uh, I'm not going to comment on the timing of uh, working on the valve. As Dr. Cordero said, there's a lot of issues regarding that. But regarding the procedure that Dr. Chagli has mentioned about going through the groin or going through the just to have a stent within the valve. It is available, but it's not available in the Tri-Cities, unfortunately, and it's available right now for people who cannot tolerate open heart surgery, which is the traditional factor. And as Dr. Chagli said, we hope over the last, f for the next few years, that's gonna be available for uh, uh, more, more, more and more patients, and we hope we are working, uh, we hope, uh, to bring that uh, procedure to Cadillac in the next uh, few years. It's a dream, but we are working on that. Absolutely. <laughs> question right here, ma'am. This, uh, this is sort of a general question. Before I had uh, knee replacement in 2010, I had to have a test to make sure that I was, my heart was okay. And um, they asked me, when did you have a heart attack? And I said, I didn't have a heart attack. Well, they said, according to the test, I must have had a heart attack. So how would I have known that I had a mild heart attack? And what can I, is it, am I a candidate for a heart attack in the future? And it's, the doctor told me it was in the inferior part of the heart. Now, what she is referring for is a test we call an ECG or electrocardiogram, which is a recording of the electrical activity of the heart through some stickers placed on the chest wall and recording to a machine to see the electrical activity of the heart, what we call ECG or EKG. Sometimes this test can be read in different, it can be read and indicate that there is an evidence of a heart attack. Again, the sensitivity and the predictability of that test may differ and that Sometimes it may reflect an evidence of a heart attack, but sometimes it might be overcalling. Having said that, there is something known called silent myocardial infarction or silent heart attacks. And actually, there are around 25% of total heart attacks. They are silent. People, they never fill them. And unfortunately, there is no way that we can identify people and tell them you had a heart attack away from the without the tests of ECGs or echocardiogram or some other test. So if we have identified them, we have to treat them as if they are people with known evident heart attack and to be aggressive with their risk factors, the blood pressure, cholesterol, and on medications. Do we need to go and try to find the artery to try to open the artery for that? The general question is no, but that's also a question that can sp we can spend an hour answering that question. Quick question for Dr. Cooper. 
we've talked, Sue touched on the symptoms she felt, but what are the differences? What's the difference between what a, man, a man's heart attack symptoms would be versus a woman? I think we have to talk first about what are the typical symptoms that you see. And I think in addressing to your silent heart attack, sometimes yes, it's silent, and sometimes it may that you didn't even recognize what the symptom was because it wasn't what you were expecting. And unfortunately for women, they tend to be more, have more atypical symptoms, and they tend to ignore them a little better um, or assume it's just in their head or in their stress. So part of that's the whole reason we're doing this, this event is to help you recognize sooner what your risks are and maybe what your symptoms are and how they differ. So when you read the textbook case of somebody coming into the emergency room with a heart attack, everybody thinks that they're supposed to come in having this terrible chest pain. And a lot of people have heard that it goes down their left arm or that they might be short of breath. What people often don't understand is that chest pain usually isn't this horrible thing that you would always think of pain. It's often described more as a weight or a pressure or a tightness. And that can vary from something crushing like an elephant on your chest to, you know, I just feel like I can't take a full breath type symptom. And you can have pain that's in your back between your shoulder blades. It can go up your neck and to your jaw. It can go down either arm. And for women, it's more typical that it may present in those positions in those areas. You can be short of breath. Your only symptom may be that you're more winded and that you can't vacuum the floor like you did yesterday. You may be more tired. In fact, fatigue with women or increasing fatigue is one of the symptoms that is very atypical that you don't see as often in men that you see much more in women. I'm just so tired. I just feel exhausted. And that may be the only thing they have. Some people will present with nausea or pain in their upper abdomen. And that is, again, more typical of women. Sweatiness, dizziness, any of those things can be associated with the heart. So it may be that you felt short of breath and thought you were just having a tired day and had not slept enough, and that was the only thing that you had that was your heart attack. Which brings us to the point that if you're experiencing one of these things and it's out of character for you, or it's something new that's been getting progressively worse, it's time to come in and be checked and not just assume that you're making it up or that it's in your head or that it's just indigestion or that it's just stress is the other thing that's commonly done. Question right in the middle. Is there a certain age to be checked out for um, risk factors? Like, for instance, I have three out of four grandparents who had stroke, and all of them were thin, active, non-smokers, non-diabetic. I mean, your discussion about the the heart rhythms was fascinating, um, but I guess my question is heart disease, and I mean. In, stroke, heart attack, help explaining all of that and what and when to start doing something beyond healthy lifestyle, diet, non-smoking. So uh, obviously it's recommended that people, they start for the cholesterol check at the age of 25 to check their baseline lipid profile. And then it's recommended to have checking the uh, risk factors, blood pressure, on an annual or biannual levels, depending on the readings. If it's less than 120, they can wait for two years. If it's between 120 to 140, they need an annual checkup. For the cholesterol, if it is normal, they can wait for five years to check for another uh, uh, cholesterol levels. For the diabetes, it's again an annual checkup through a blood test, fasting blood test. So when to start? Early 20s is the answer for, for that, to mid 20s, to start checking for these risk factors. Does but, that answer the question? But if you had that family history of multiple people in your family, would you, say, start taking aspirin, say, five or ten years before any of them had their first event? I wish we had the answer for that. <laughs> 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 no, but again, uh, that's a, a great question. Some other uh, fields in medicine, they have answered that question about to start head start five, ten years, like the colon cancer. But for the... Uh, Stroke and heart disease, again, we don't have a good answer that we can go be below before five or 10 years, but we can say that the moment that the sooner the better, let's put it this way, the sooner the better that you can control your risk factor and instead of waiting for 40s, 50s to start primary prevention. From the 20s, to start looking for the risk factors, healthy lifestyle, weight control, no smoking, this is, and then decide about the aspirin depending on the overall assessment of the risk factors. Okay, we have time for two more questions. 
If one is taking um, statin drugs, um, how often should should one have um, tests to, to test the lipid panel uh, as to how well they're working? Yes, there are two uh, two theories behind that. Be, be, to answer your question, the traditional thing they are saying six to twelve months to check your blood test to see the response of the lipid and the cholesterol to your statins. A few months ago, in late 2013, new guidelines came out, and they are saying, if you are having coronary heart disease, don't worry what's your cholesterol, just take the statin. And one some final, people, they will say. One final don't question, you. I want to start with Sue, and, and you touched on kind of your life after your cardiac event, and I, I would start with you and have the rest of our panelists weigh in quickly is, is is there is it hard to keep that changed lifestyle if you will that improved lifestyle of or is it because of what you went through it's a daily motivation that i know where i was and i don't want to go back there and do, the, to the physicians do you you probably hear that occasionally that it's they kind of fall off the wagon if you will and that's why they end up back in your office potentially i, I think the hardest thing for me is to um, manage the stress and so it, it's difficult to, you know, I know in my head what's important and what's not important, but as, you know, things build up in your day, it's, it's hard to kind of manage that and you, you kind of stray. And there are days when I am overstressed. And to be honest, uh, this last week during a lunchtime meeting, I started feeling pains in my chest. And I haven't done that for a long time. And I didn't have my purse with me. My purse was in my car in the parking lot. So I didn't tell anybody what was going on, but I shifted my computer over to my colleague and I saw it back. I ran out to my car and I had one bare aspirin in my little bear bottle. So I took it and I felt better. But I don't get frightened very often, but that was a, another wake up call and I thought, whoa, settle down, you know, keep things in balance and um, just focus on what's important. So, you know, once in a while, you just have to kind of reel yourself back in and think, all these things I get spun up about are not really essential in the grand scheme of things. Um, but anyway. Any of our other panelists that same question? Do you see patients that end up back or they, they lose their motivation or, or is that, I guess that's the mental health part of what we're talking about today is, is pretty vital as well? I think actually the motivation factor, it's the same issue before and after. Why aren't we motivated before to be healthy and to feel better and to prevent horrific disease. And just because you have an event at that time, you're scared, you're worried about it, people are convinced they're going to make changes. But those habits die hard. And so really, it's starting when you're young and teaching your children and being example for your daughters and granddaughters and sons of a healthy lifestyle. We know, I mean, this country knows that smoking is horrible for people. Um, and if, if one of us prescribed tobacco, I'm, I'm sure that we would be losing our license with the horrificness in it, and yet this country continues to smoke, and our young people, are, and our women especially, are smoking more than they were 10 years ago. So if we can't do it before, just because you had one scary event doesn't mean you're going to do it after either. You might for a while, and it might wake up some people, um, but the same processes of your habits are there before, and it has to start when you're young, and it has to be a, a global effort, really. We'll just Actually, quickly go right down the line. <clears throat> Actually, two quick points. Yes, motivation is, will start to decrease uh, with time. That's why I usually use the time when the patient is on the cath table. And I look at them and say, do you smoke? And he says, yes. I said, wrong answer. No, you don't smoke anymore. <laughs> this is the time that it's the time to change. And obviously, many people, they will go back and start smoking again. That's why we have that regular checkups, reminding them you have to be on the risk factors. One last point quickly, I'm just going to take a second here. We are concentrating on the primary prevention, but I want to just bring up one more thing that I believe is very important and having people here just to talk about it, that Dr. Cooper said that when people come to the emergency room with a heart attack or signs of a heart attack, we start, uh, uh, she starts jumping on the phone, she starts calling me or my, one of my partners to come to the emergency room to take the patient to the cath lab to open that artery as quickly as possible and uh, 
people from the cath lab, they will come next to me, next morning to me and said, why you are spending two minutes more to open the artery? And we are rushing all of that time. But really, we are talking about the last 60 minutes, the last 90 minutes of the whole episode. It starts with you at home identifying the episodes of the heart attack. And as Dr. Cooper said, it doesn't need to be a Hollywood heart attack with crushing chest on the, with crushing pressure on the chest going to the left arm. If you suspect it, come to the emergency room, check it out, because it's much better to be safe than, rather than being sorry. And many times I feel bad when people, they are having chest pain for three, four days, and then they come to the emergency room. It's like you are trying to walk a marathon and the last uh, 500 yards you decided to run. So that's another point that I like just to emphasize. Sorry, to do. Dr. Kneller. Well, I would say the motivational piece is, is really important. I'm thinking of the I'm thinking of the office setting where you have patients who are relatively stable on good therapy, and to remind them when they come in that they are doing the right thing, and encourage them to keep going, and you know applaud people for making gains in the areas of their lives where they have improved, and help them identify areas that we still have to work on. Um, I've gone as far as to recommend hypnosis to people who are trying to, st to stop smoking because I realize how hard it can be and sometimes the medical therapies just don't work for people. Um, but I think the motivational piece, especially coming from, um, from physicians is really important and that's a time to really leverage the ethos you have from, the, from that position to encourage people um, to make those lifestyle changes and to, and to adhere to them. Dr. Um. Cordero? Yeah, human behavior is uh, extremely difficult to change. And uh, when we do heart surgery on our patients and we see them early on after surgery, a month later, uh, most of the patients have, uh, who are smoking are not smoking at that time. Now, uh, and the diabetics are controlling their sugars and all those kind of things. But as time passes, things change. And our society, the Society of Thoracic Surgeons, did a study a few years ago uh, where they looked at patients who had heart surgery. And at 12 months, only about 18% of patients we're still involved in modifying risk factors. So it's really one out of five, and that's only 12 months out. That's not a huge time frame. Uh, they didn't look at 24 months. So early on, patients are involved, but then as time fades, a lot of times the patients fall back into their old lifestyle. And that's really, that's really just the nature of human behavior, not just with heart disease, but any other, any other uh, behavioral modification. And finally, Dr. Shogley. Oh, thank you. Uh, no, heart surgery is a life-changing event. People have a big scar, they're in the ICU and everything. So what happens is I've seen multiple times that when they come and see me in the office in two or three weeks, they tell me, oh, Dr. Chaugle, I have stopped eating red meat. I eat, I drink only water and vegetables and don't do anything else and I've lost five pounds and everything. And I tell them, that's wrong. That's totally wrong because this, you cannot sustain this. If you stop everything, you're going to rebound back and you're going to eat a lot of it and you're going to have problem. What you should do is moderation. You can eat everything, but eat everything in moderation. Make sure you are not running 10 miles a day. You cannot sustain that for lifelong. Walk one mile a day. You cannot say, I don't eat red meat at all. I don't eat any oily food. Eat them, but in moderation, little amount of oily food or little amount of meat, that's important because people, we have seen people who stop everything and trust me, a lot of people after heart surgery will say, oh, I don't do this, don't do that. But memory, people forget, tend to forget and then say, oh, this doesn't matter. And they, one year down the road, as Dr. Cordero said, only one out of five people have stuck to their life modification uh, program. So what I tell everyone, eat everything, do everything, but do in moderation and enjoy life. Because at the end of the day, we do cardiac surgery to improve the quality of life and there is no quality of life without being able to eat without being able to do anything you cannot sustain on water and say I've got a good quality of life on that note what better way to end please uh, thank you to all of our panelists today it's so generous of you to share your time today and again I, I marvel that we have them all in one room